It's been a breathtaking 24 hours in Syria. For the millions who had lived under the brutal Assad regime, a wave of elation and relief erupted when the news broke of him being ousted. Here's what it looked like and sounded like when the rebels rolled into key cities, including the capital, Damascus. You can see celebrations are breaking out everywhere. This woman actually has just offered me some sweets. Mabruk and the Lebanese miss from Syria. This is the mood right now. It is festive. It is jubilant. Take a look with me. You can see people are waving the flag, the flag of the Syrian revolution. It has got three stars. You can see children. And it's just an extraordinary moment. I think no one realized that this would ever actually happen after so many years of waiting, so many years. A lot of fireworks as well. Let's keep moving. So this man is from the city of Homs. He is obviously completely overcome with joy at what is happening here. We can see these little girls here as well. Maraba, min wain kun. Min Surya, min Aymanda, min Surya. Min Aymanda. Min Idlib. Okay. Sharapna into Mabsuta Hala. Kitir, Kitir Mabsut. Yes, Kutal Asad. They said they're very happy. Bashar al Assad has fallen. CNN Chief International Security Correspondent Nick Payton Walsh has more on assault, Assad's fall from power. Decades of savage, horrific rule over in a matter of days. Thousands of Syrians celebrated in the streets of Damascus after rebel forces advanced on the capital early Sunday morning, declaring it free of President Bashar al-Assad. We announce to you from the Syrian news channel the victory of the great Syrian revolution after 13 years of patience and sacrifice. We won the bet and toppled the criminal Assad regime. Facing crumbling resistance from regime forces, rebels launched a stunning lightning offensive. Russia undermining its long-term ally by announcing he had fled the country and was granted asylum in Moscow. Hours of jubilation followed as civilians and rebels entered the presidential palace, looting furniture with children running about, a sign of how every day the suffering he inflicted had been. Some even touring the presidential kitchen in a land where starvation was once a weapon. What would you like, one woman says while filming, our people are hungry, take whatever you want. Traces of Assad were being dismantled across the country. This statue of the man who had children gassed in a Ghouta basement 11 years ago toppled in the eastern city of Tartus. His image torn down from buildings in Damascus and on top of the gates of Homs city centre. Symbolically where protesters tore apart his image more than a decade ago in a scene that defined the civil war's early days. 
Inspired by the seismic shifts of the Arab Spring, Syrians rose up in 2011 demanding democracy but were met with live rounds and eventually jet planes, chemical weapons and mass executions and torture. Hundreds of thousands were killed, millions displaced. As rebels swept through the capital on Sunday, images surfaced of prisoners being released from the notorious Saidnaya prison from which so few emerged. Dubbed the human slaughterhouse by Amnesty International. The militant figure leading this rebel offensive is Abu Muhammad al Jalani, seen here prostrating in prayer upon entering Damascus. Once affiliated with Al Qaeda, Jalani has been suggesting he has matured from his extremist roots, though there are deep concerns about what kind of new Syria may now emerge. At one of the oldest mosques in the world in Damascus, he was received with applause and jeers as he hailed total victory. This victory, my brothers, is a victory for the entire Islamic nation. This new triumph, my brothers, marks a new chapter in the history of the region. Without doubt a new chapter, but with the joy of change comes anxiety at the future and surely a reckoning of sorts for the decades of horror past that could mire the hope of the days ahead. CNN's chief international correspondent, Clarissa Ward, is inside Syria right now. Just a short time ago, she spoke to us from Damascus, the capital. Here is some of what she said. Well, Wolf, I have to say the moment is just utterly surreal for those of us who have been covering this story for more than 14 years. Uh, it never seemed possible that it would end like this. Um, I want to say that the streets are incredibly calm, incredibly quiet, but you can see just behind me a few cars have been going through the street. There's actually a curfew in place from 4 p.m. to 6 a.m. That is a security measure, of course. There has been some looting in Damascus earlier on, some chaotic scenes. And so as a precaution, as we saw in Aleppo, they have put this uh, curfew into place. I want to show you, though, Wolf, a clip of the moment that we cross the border, because this is a border that I cross many times uh, when I used to live in Lebanon, when I used to cover Syria at the very, very beginning of the uprising. And the contrast from what it was and what we experienced tonight is just startling. So take a look at this. So we are just crossing now into Syria. It's astonishing to see. It's absolutely empty. The border points before there would have been soldiers, there would have been border guards. Now there is absolutely nobody from the Syrian regime. Just a few friendly people waving us through. And honestly, the last time I came down this road was back in 2011. I was leaving Syria. I had been undercover in Damascus, posing as a tourist, went back into Lebanon. And I never imagined this moment would come when we would be driving through this border with no one from the regime to stop us. scene at that border crossing as we pass through it. Again, it was already dark, already past curfew, very, very quiet, and just nothing like we've seen it before. The only real evidence we saw, Wolf, of any struggle to finally take uh, Damascus, to finally oust Bashar al-Assad, was a tank in the road below a torn poster of President, or I should say former President, Bashar al-Assad. And Wolf, uh, my cameraman, Scott McWinnie, just found this on the ground, literally, as we were listening to that clip. This is the old flag of the Syrian regime, which has two green stars. The rebels' flag has three green stars, but this one has now been, literally, we just found it on the floor. Uh, I guess a real moment where you see how much things have changed just in the past 24 hours. In terms of the security situation on the streets, I would just add, we anticipated that we might see quite a lot of checkpoints as we came into the city. We didn't. We did see a group of men. Um, they did not appear to be armed, but they asked us what we were doing, where we were going. And now that we are sort of ensconced uh, in our place where we're staying for the night. We have seen a couple of patrols. I saw two men armed 
and I went up to them and asked them where they were from. They told me they were from Idlib, which is in the northern part of the country. And we saw a man on the street go up and wanted to pose for a photograph of them, which I think sort of speaks to the moment. There is obviously jubilation, elation, but also this sense of you can't compute. It was so fast, so breathtaking. It's astonishing. And I think people are taking some time to try to process the magnitude. Keep in mind, Wolf, we're talking about 53 years of Assad rule, 53 years of a brutal police state. And I can't tell you how many Syrians have said to me, Wolf, that, you know, we understand that there are concerns about the rebels and the makeup of the rebels and the fact that some of them are Islamists and some of them are even jihadists or have been affiliated with Al Qaeda or prescribed organizations. But let us have this moment. Let us celebrate the fact that this brutal dictator who has ruthlessly killed hundreds of thousands of people, who has gassed children with lethal nerve agents, who has locked people in prisons and tortured and beaten them to death, that he is finally gone. And that whatever may come, and whatever the anxiety, this is a new chapter for Syria, Wolf. Bashar al-Assad inherited his father's totalitarian regime and left it and his country in ruins a thuggish police state in a brutal repression turned war where hundreds of thousands of civilians were killed and more than half the population fled their homes he'll be remembered um, as one of the most violent uh, rulers in response to the uprisings that started in late 2010 in the arab world he'll also be remembered as the a failing endpoint of the Assad dynasty that his father had started that lasted for over 42 years, but it collapsed under him. Bashar al-Assad never expected to take over from his father. His older brother Basil was the heir apparent. Instead, Bashar trained as an ophthalmologist in London. Former Assad family insiders say he didn't have the right stuff to run Syria. <laughs> His brother Basel bullied him as a child. His father never gave him as much attention as Basel. But a high-speed car crash killed Basel, and Bashar was brought back home to learn the family business. When President Hafez al-Assad died in 2000, Syria's elite pushed Bashar into the presidency, keeping 30 years of their own wealth, power, position and influence intact. <laughs> Hafez was a leader, the head of the entire regime, while Bashar never came close to that. At first, the new president agreed to modest reforms and released hundreds of political prisoners. But that brief moment of optimism, dubbed the Damascus Spring, ended abruptly. A decade later, the regional upheaval known as the Arab Spring wouldn't be addressed as easily. Protests demanding change spread across Syria in early 2011. The regime cracked down, turning peaceful protest into slaughter. The UN found what it called massive evidence of war crimes, crimes against humanity, responsibility at the highest level of government, including the head of state. Assad, the deceptively gentle face of an increasingly desperate regime, denied responsibility in one of his rare encounters with a Western journalist. They are not my forces. They are military forces belong to the government. Okay, but you're I don't government. own them. I'm president. The chaos spawned countless local militias and opposition forces. In the mayhem, the ultra-violent Islamist group ISIS gained a temporary foothold, spewing its nihilistic terror over the border into Iraq. US and Iraqi forces confronted and ultimately crushed them, but didn't challenge Assad's brutal authority. Fearing the developing threat, the United States led a coalition to fight Assad's terrorist enemies for him, ISIS and Al-Qaeda. Russia, too, joined the fight. Assad and his allies, Hezbollah from Lebanon, an Iranian militia, were losing ground, committing more forces than any other country 
with barbaric, internationally condemned ground and air assaults. Russia turned the tide in Assad's favour. But when Russia's forces went to war in Ukraine in 2022, the clock on Assad's rule began ticking down. By late 2024, his other main allies, Iran and Hezbollah, were blooded by over a year-long war with Israel. Assad's fortunes plummeted. Former al-Qaeda turned nationalist Islamist Hayat Tahrir al-Sham surged out of their northern enclave, exploiting Assad's allies' weakness, overrunning the country. Within two weeks, Assad had fled to Russia, ending his family's half-century ruthless repression of the Syrian people. His life in exile begins, living in the shadow of fear. His heinous crimes will eventually catch up with him. And I want to bring in Nick Robertson now. And Nick, my apologies. That was my mistake. That was your reporting that we just saw and listened to. Um, and it really does just give us such a vast picture of, of the B Bashar al-Assad and the uh, Assad family uh, regime and the control that they exerted over Syria for so long. Yeah, and the, and the bloody aftermath of that control. I mean, they, they were the ones in 2012, I remember, uh, during the Civil War there, being in this small town where the tanks and the heavy machine guns were arraigned against a civilian population. We managed to get out before, the, before they started shooting uh, those heavy weapons. But that came and it lasted what we've seen over, over 12 years. You know, the toll that Assad has left behind has been documented. I mean, his forces documented it. There was the famous case of a um, police military photographer from one of the jails. He, he went by the pseudonym of Caesar. He left the country, got asylum uh, outside of Syria, and he took with him a catalogue of photographs, about 10,000 photographs, that literally catalogued more than 6,000 deaths in Assad's jails. So the uh, accounts, if you will, the documents that could be used to put Assad in court one day to be held account uh, uh, for his crimes are there. And the use of chemical weapons, the use of chlorine gas back in 2018 and numerous other times, that time killing 43 people, or the use of the deadly nerve agent, sarin, uh, 2017, just a few years ago. Assad, the leader of a country, dropping a deadly nerve agent on, on his citizens, killing more than 90 of them. These are all documented. The evidence is there. And that he could literally one day face that in court. And that's something he'll be thinking about all through uh, his remaining years in exile. Yeah, no doubt about that. Nick Robertson in London, thank you very much for that reporting. I'd like to bring in former NATO Supreme Allied Commander General Wesley Clark. Uh, General, thanks so much for joining us. When we left you last night, um, this was all really unfolding. Uh, and now here we are 24 hours later, and the Assad regime has officially fallen. Um, what do you make of where we stand right now? Well, I think uh, right now the question is really what, what's going to happen there in Damascus and in the rest of Syria, because there are contending factions. Um, the Syrian Democratic forces that we're supporting and U.S. forces in the south, as President Biden made a lot of strikes against ISIS, those Syrian Democratic forces are going to try to expand uh, their, uh, their reach. Uh, the Kurds are going to be very, very concerned about what happens because th uh, this HTS group has had backing from Turkey. And President Erdogan was the first uh, of the uh, national leaders who said uh, when this was all unfolding a couple of days ago, he says, well, I hope they'll, uh, that everyone will get out of the way and, uh, and support them. So he's behind this group. Uh, and that's not good news for the Kurds. But President Erdogan and Turkey have always had uh, larger ambitions to stabilize this region and and to do more. Uh, on the one hand, that could be helpful, and on the other hand, it will bring its own challenges and uh, rivalries from other regional powers, and uh, all that's going to play out because um, it, it would be very surprising if HTS has a constitutional game plan to to call the UN in, uh, supervise some elections, uh, elected uh, parliament and so forth. I, I hope it happens, uh, but it would be really remarkable if it does. Mm. Instead, what's likely to happen is uh, one party rule uh, behind the scenes, cutting deals of some people will be cut out. The real question is, uh, what about these terrorists that are being held in northeast Syria? 
for goodness sake, if they get released, uh, that's a whole nother level of challenge for the United States and, and, and for the region. So uh, there are many, many uncertainties in this. One thing, though, Jessica, is President Biden did take credit for this and his support of Israel and the way that the United States has handled it. And there's no doubt that the weakening of Iran, the weakening of Hezbollah and so forth, Israel's actions in, have enabled uh, this to occur. As far as Russia is concerned, um, I suspect that the President Erdogan, President Putin have got this worked out. Uh, the, the naval base will stay there. Uh, the terrorists won't bother the Russians. This gives, uh, actually, for President Erdogan, it's good. He's got a little cold card to play uh, with Mr. Putin if he has to, because uh, it, through his influence in this regime, if he has that influence, and again, we don't know that for sure, uh, but he can, you know, turn the screws on Mr. Putin on those naval bases and and, uh, and the airfield when he wants to. And so uh, in this region, everybody's talking to everybody all of the time at various levels. So um, there's a lot more to, to see as this unravels. I'm joined now by Danny Mackey. He's a Syrian journalist and analyst who's covered the conflict for the Middle East Institute. Danny, thanks so much for joining us. You're in Damascus right now. What have these past 24 hours been like? Well, they've been historic for the perspective of anyone who has... Mm. Danny, I think you're free. And has actually okay. viewed what's happened over the previous period. And for, from my perspective, being in Syria and actually watching what's happening is super... Uh, it's historic because what we've seen for a country that's been through so much war and pain to actually come together and remove this regime which has been here for over 60 years it's something quite significant and against all odds because the whole world has kind of come together just to uh, destroy the hopes and dreams of the syrian people and now what we're seeing is a country you reunited again in a different different mode now where everyone is coming together there are so many different challenges which uh, the syrian people together can face and assad is out of the picture he's no longer in the country and before we talk about that different mode and what's ahead for Syria, did anyone in Syria have any sense that the Assad regime would crumble this quickly? Well, no one envisaged this. This was something completely unique. It was something that not one analyst or pundit would have even thought of that was possible of happening because Assad was really in a lead position. He was in Idlib. He was literally closing in on Idlib. You know, he was going to finish the military side of the conflict. But, you know, wars are just not about winning battles. And you have to win the peace. You have to win hearts and minds. And in a country where you haven't found a solution to a root cause problem, you really need to make sure that you're not complacent. And Assad got complacent. You know, he took, put too much faith in his allies, in the Iranians in the Russians, in Hezbollah. Hezbollah was absolutely damaged by the, the Israelis. The Iranians have just constantly been keeping uh, just losses in the region on every single way. The Russians have their own quagmire in, in Ukraine. So all of Assad's allies are facing huge, you know, major problems that, to their own security. So none of them were able to actually step in and help him. So what that did was put extra pressure on the Syrian army an army which is based on conscription. And Assad, in the last two years, issued a number of different rules which actually um, made sure that many of the conscripts were new. So Assad was sending new fighters to the front lines against groups such as H, uh, uh, HTS, Hayat yeah. Tahrir al-Sham, which were seasoned, experienced fighters, and they were just getting smashed in Aleppo. And that's what triggered this collapse. Mm, that's really interesting insight. So, as you know, Assad was ousted by this coalition of rebel groups, some of them linked historically to al-Qaeda. And the rebel leader at the moment appears to be Abu Muhammad al-Jalani. He talked exclusively to CNN's Jumana uh, Karache about his goal now for Syria. So listen to this. Once an al-Qaeda leader, your group has had affiliations with al-Qaeda, with ISIS, and now you are projecting this image of a moderate leader and a moderate group. 
What is HTS right now? Hayat Tahrir al-Sham is one of the factions in the region, just like all the others. Now we're talking about a larger project. We're talking about building Syria. Hayat Tahrir al-Sham is merely one detail of this dialogue, and it may dissolve at any time. It's not an end in itself, but a means to perform a task confronting this regime. So, Danny, when you hear that, do you have confidence that this group won't just usher in a new era of violence or some different type of authoritarian rule? Well, typically you'd say that going to change at the end of the day. Uh, but what we've seen, especially in locations such as Aleppo, is the decline of these radical sentiments where, you know, you have a lot of minorities in Aleppo. It's an area which has a lot of, uh, it, it, it's far more diverse than other places in Syria. And hey, Tahrir al-Sham have in Aleppo been very uh, uh, positive with the minorities. And they have massacres or, you know, taking out minorities. So what we could definitely say is that there is a behavioral change, even if, even if it might be minimal. But in Damascus, Hama, Homs, we haven't seen this from other minorities. The city of Salamiya is an Ismaili city. It's in the eastern side of Hama, and it's an area which fought ISIS and Jabhat al-Nusra for a number of years. Hayat Tahrir al-Sham didn't even go near Salamiya. They reached some sort of agreement with the notables of the area. These citizens are what have actually led Hayat Tahrir al-Sham. Mm. Danny, uh, Danny, we're having obviously some technical issues because you're in Damascus, but thank you for the insight. That has been so interesting to get your perspective on the ground there, and we'll talk again. Thank you so much.